Welcome and thank you for joining us for what promises to be a lively and probably quite passionate debate uh, about the best future refrigerant options for commercial refrigeration and supermarkets. Is CO2 the future or is it a, a natural a flammable option like propane or maybe it's a low GWP A2L option. We're coming to you today from all over Europe. Uh, we've got people from uh, Denmark, from France, uh, from Germany and here in the, the UK. Uh, my name's David Maguire. I've been writing about this industry for about 15 years, and I'm here to act as a, a sort of independent referee to ensure fair play, because each of our experts today has quite a strong point of view about the future of refrigerants in this sector based on long experience in the industry. We have Anders Yule, who is Global CO2 Director at uh, Danfoss. No prizes for guessing uh, what he'll be uh, in favour of, I'm sure. Uh, Thierry Raoul, uh, who is Marketing Director Hi. for Refrigeration. Uh, and Jörg Saar, who is Global Applications Manager at Danfoss. Gentlemen, thanks for joining us. Um, I will uh, accept no fighting. Uh, you have to uh, be on your best behavior. Uh, now, if you have any comments about this discussion or any questions, we'd like to invite you to join our experts in the chat room after the debate. Uh, our colleague will share a, a link for you uh, a little later on. Okay, if you're ready, then let's begin. Um, I'd like to start by asking you, if gas has been in force since January 2015, We've known about it for quite a lot longer than that. Why is it that we're talking about this now? Uh, why is this a good time to talk about refrigerant change in uh, commercial and supermarket refrigeration? Hey, David, we, we, we should keep in mind that the uh, F-Gas version, the current one, have been I would say, entering in force, I would say, as you said, in January 25. So it's just five years back. Okay, it's not a long, long, long years ago. Uh, and all, during this time of period, a lot of lot of industry players, stakeholders, uh, make a lot of progress. Question regarding about the solution because it was a brutal, I would say, change on the uh, on the market. And and a lot of new product, new solutions have been implemented and emerged during this time of period. That means I would say, if we look back five years back, many many questions. Today we have answer. Today they have solutions. And also we cannot forget that. Uh, and during the last years, also you uh, ratified the Kigali agreements, meaning that also paying attention to the reduction of the HFC emissions. That means it's also a way to keep in mind, I mean, what could be, I would say, the uh, CO2 emission reductions inside the F-gas and for the next, uh, I'm sure, I would say, revision of the F-gas. It, it will not be, I would say, uh, we will change certainly again the F-gas in the coming years. And we should have in mind that we need to continuously, I would say, pay attention to that. And please remind that next year, they will have another, I would say, shift or ban or reduction of CO2 because I would say we'll certainly will reduce by 30% from the top of my head, I would say the quantity of CO2 emissions on the industry. That means it's still a topic for the industry. It's still a focus we have to pay attention. Okay, so, but we know that the race is for lower and lower GWP, that the, that the standards will, will, will keep getting tougher on that. So why don't we just look for a good refrigerant with the lowest GWP now and use that everywhere? Jörg? Well, uh, um, there, is, there is no one solution. I think we, we all can agree on that. We have strong opinions, as you said, about certain refrigerants, yes. But there is not one single refrigerant that can cover it all. GWP, as you mentioned, that is one criteria, yes. But there are some others. It's cost of the whole system. It is the emission of the system due to its operation. It needs energy, electrical energy to operate, and that generates emissions as well. And On top because of that, of that right? combination, you don't, have, you don't have it all. I agree. And and there's, even, there's even more examples, right? If you look into standards and safety, so uh, there's a lot of areas to uncover when you work with this. There's chart limits, there's flammability, um, uh, there's the ease of service on different kind of systems. There's of course, CO2 in this area can then is different than, for example, one of the flammables. So it's something we need to be take very much into account. And it's definitely something on the standards we use a lot of time off in Danfoss, for example, when designing valves. 
And, and when we are talking about I would say lowest GLP and uh, referring to the A2L, what we have in mind is only I would say focusing on the refrigerants having a GLP below 150. That means this is for the medium term and long term. We do not want to pay attention I would say to to a GLP refrigerants or refrigerants having a GLP close to 1,000. No. Is already available. That means I would say for us, clearly, when we talk about A2L, is refrigerants having a GLP below 150 that could meet, I would say, the uh, target of the F gas under the ban 11, 12, or 13. Okay, so you guys have mentioned quite a lot of uh, different factors there around safety, efficiency, that kind of thing. Which ones do you think are most relevant? when you're choosing a, a refrigerant for the, the, the future? Thierry? Ah, good questions. <laughs> Globally speaking, I think uh, we, if we pay attention to the CO2 emissions, we need to pay attention to two factors, okay? The direct emission, which is linked to the refrigerants, but the global, I would say, uh, emission during the years, meaning the energy efficiency on the yearly base. And this one, I feel, is very, very important. The second level, it could be, the, I would say, the safety and availability of the product to uh, uh, the installer and contractors to be sure that the end users could also have a good understanding with how he can also develop and secure how we say the medium term and long term of his installation. Yeah, I agree, especially when we talk about the installations and how a system looks like. You you mentioned safety and, and system design and when you look at certain refrigerants for example, a flammable has the advantage that you can go with a pretty conventional system design. And it gives you a very, very low global warming potential, so a very low GWP. And in addition, it is a natural molecule, so it does not fall under the F-gas regulation. And due to that, it will probably never be banned. So we need to look at that as well, what, what comes in, in oh. some years. I'm with you on that, Dirk, and that's the good thing about CO2. It's again, it's a natural refrigerant like our friend ammonia, but CO2 is not flammable. Uh, mm. Of course, here you then need to monitor other other things. So, fully with you on that. And Thierry, you mentioned that there are also A2L refrigerants with very low GWP, sort of below 150, that are unlikely to be banned really anytime soon. Could you give us some examples of those? Yeah, you know, we are considering, for example, I would say the refrigerant 1234YF that mm -hmm. could replace the 134A. It's really good, I would say, refrigerants, I would say, available refrigerants, already used, I would say, in air conditioning for the car industry, for example. We also have, I would say, clearly, I would say, availability of the 454C. It's a chemical um, refrigerant coming from uh, Shemur. And we also have, I would say, the 455A, okay, from Honeywell. That means, I would say, these three refrigerants today are really, I would say, something we can consider to be part of the solutions for the, uh, with the A2L. And uh, coming back with what you said, Jörg, the charge limit of the A2L is a little bit higher than the A3 refrigerants such as propane. And we cannot forget that we have also um, have some standard we, we need to respect and take in consideration. Mm -hmm. Keep in mind, safety is also something very important. And uh, unless you mentioned uh, the flammability, fine, fair enough, it's, it's very, uh, completely right what you said, but CO2, I would say, can generate, I would say, pressure, and pressure means something also linked to safety in some extent. Yeah, so, I mean, talking about safety, I think that, you know, it's probably a good idea to uh, to talk about the people that will actually be handling the refrigerants, you know, building systems, maintaining and uh, servicing them. What implications are there for, for them when it comes to, to refrigerant choice? Yeah, CO2 is a good choice uh, uh, in many aspects when you are, if you don't want to deal with flammability or or the F gas in general, but of course you need you need to take care of uh, that your components that you choose they are uh, ready for working with higher pressures uh, and so on. Uh, other than that, there's really no special requirements for CO2. Well, yeah, okay, yes, um, you don't have flammability, that's true, but you have to to face the higher pressures not everybody is used to that and and you need maybe some new equipment you need to pay attention to asphyxiation that co2 will not will not collect somewhere if you go to hydrocarbons they offer you a very normal pressure range as you have it had as you have had it so far it 
that they are flammable, yes, but there are safe tools available so that professionals can handle these refrigerants in a safe way. Uh, it's the same for the A2L. Mm -hmm. The A2L, you can use, I would say, what you have right now, okay, uh, in terms of uh, design architecture and so on, that they have not a huge change versus what we have uh, uh, in the market uh, designed during the last uh, 10 years, 20 years. That mean they have, you know, apart the charge limit, linked to the slightly flammable constraint of the A2L, you can do practically, I would say, a system such as you design or you were designing a 404A or 134A system in the past. So you're talking about charge limits there. How much refrigerant are we uh, talking about uh, uh, with each of the, these approaches? Because they're different standards, aren't they? Yeah. Yeah. There yes, are correct. Oh, Terry, uh, go. Sorry. Uh, no, uh, yeah, correct. I would say for both, as you can see, we, we talk about, I would say, flammability, we talk about pressure, we talk about, I would say, safety. But I think in Europe, globally speaking, they have a very nice standard already available. And people need to really pay attention to this standard. And you can find a lot of answer to the installation design criteria to ensure that the safety of the people will be at the level which is requested. And this standard is the EN 3, uh, 378. On this 378, you can have very good recommendations to design component, to design system, to design installation, to secure the piping of the CO2, to secure the piping of the A2L, such as, such as a, a criteria. On the top of that, also, we have, uh, for, I would say, flammable, in a bracket, A2L, A3, in this case, mm -hmm. uh, we have, I would say, uh, some standard also, which is already existing, and one of them, for example, for propane and I give you, I will say, the chat to, to York, is the EN 6335.2.99, uh, uh, 89, sorry, 89. <laughs> yeah, exactly, They're all, all these long numbers, but yes, you are correct, that's, uh, that's an application standard. You mentioned EN 378, that's a general standard, and then there is a whole family of application standards, which is the EN 0, no, 60335, <laughs> dash two dash something and then the the 89 after that dash that describes commercial refrigeration applications and that doesn't why it was different. yeah exactly and and that standard really dives deeply into the safety aspects they have been taking into consideration already writing that standard and if you follow that standard you kind of have peace of mind because you have followed all the necessary safety measurements already. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There is a limit which says 150 grams of hydrocarbon. That exists for a longer time already and you can build smaller hermetic systems with that limit. A newer setup is now allowing 500 grams on an international level and that needs to come down to national and regional levels like in the EU, but we will see a limit of 500 grams and that 500 gram limit of hydrocarbons will offer the possibility to build slightly larger systems with these hydrocarbons still hermetic yeah but covering more capacity in a safe way that will be possible and uh and as there's charge limits aren't really a problem for co2 right I think you're on mute. Sorry. That, <laughs> exactly. That is exactly also why we have seen it uh, with the big uptake, for example, in supermarket refrigeration, where you have uh, a lot of system which distributed uh, refrigerant. Um, and here it has a great advantage. So we have talked about the flammability, but it's also, aside the pressure, it's also an easy refrigerant to charge. You don't need to uh, make sure that you collect it. Uh, you can let it. You can vent it uh, in in the in the event that you want to do that. So that's the that's the upside of the CO2. Of course, CO2. We also see it now coming in even smaller systems. But for sure, the charge limit is a big upside for our friend CO2. Thank you. We spoke earlier about the ways that refrigerant choice can impact the environment uh, apart from GWP. Um, you kind of mentioned direct and uh, indirect uh, emissions. Can we talk a bit more about those other kinds of environmental uh, impact and things like energy efficiency, for example? 
Oh, yeah. For example, A2L, if you consider as a reference for commercial reflections, the fourth way as a reference, it was a fact during the last uh, 10, 20 years back, okay, we could very, very easily assume that with the four, with the A2L, I would say, refrigerant, we can have, I would say, plus, plus 10 percent higher efficiency, globally speaking, on a yearly base. And that means, I would say, they have opportunity also, but uh, the yearly efficiency should also be uh, considered under the optimization of the system. Because today, when we look also, and when we have looked what have been designed in the past in the market in Europe, some of the systems have been oversight. And oversize of the system mean also impact on the efficiency, mean also impact on charge limits. That means they have some activity to do. But yes, it well is a solution for energy efficiency consumption. And and that's correct. Energy efficiency is, is quite a big part. I mean, the charge of the refrigerant is one. But the other one, that system is running every day for years and years and years and is consuming electric energy and that generates emissions. If you, if you take a hydrocarbon, you have the advantage of a combination of very low GWP, a natural molecule, plus a really good energy efficiency. And what comes in as well is that it has very nice thermodynamical properties. That means you have a wide application envelope, low temperatures, higher evaporating temperatures, all that is possible with that refrigerant or these types of refrigerants. And that's why they are really nice choice for commercial refrigeration systems in any climate, no matter where you put it in the world. I agree with that. And, and for then for energy efficiency is close to our heart, right? And the same goes for CO2, because when we talk direct emissions, our friend ammonia is the most difficult guy to beat, I think. Maybe also water, Jörg. And then comes CO2, and then the rest of them, they can only try to catch up. Um, <laughs> but, but of course, we have a lot of technologies, and this is why we have also seen the CO2 business grow, because we have put a lot of energy into making CO2 an efficient choice. We are not mm -hmm. there everywhere and for every application. And as we're discussing today, that will not happen. But we have adiabatic coolers. We are talking technology like ejectors. We are talking expanders. Um, and of course, when you put more technology into an application, maybe the, the application needs then to be bigger to, to cope with that capex. And when it comes to capex, I would like to, in favor of CO2, also say that we have to remember it's not always about refrigeration when you go into your application. It could be. In a supermarket, you need a lot of heat. So it could be that instead of that, and that's the reason why we see the uptake of what we could call power packs, the pack takes care of the, of the refrigeration, it takes care of the heating because you have it for free. And additionally, you could take uh, all three and then also do the chilling of your water. And suddenly you have one pack taking all of this. It's not uncommon for us today to see also a combination of chiller heat pumps. We have seen these kind of installation in hotels where you chill for the rooms and you take that excessive heat and make them go, uh, go ba bathing in that hot water. Um, so that's really important to remember that by combining technologies with the refrigerant, you can lower the capex of the total install and then, of course, you should always monitor your indirect impact by your energy consumption. And, of course, choose the right application to apply these technologies in. Thank you. But on that, I think we agree with what you said. But do you think you, you can apply such kind of technology uh, uh, creation development should happen during the last years in all applications? Nope. If you are talking nope. with CapEx? No. Nope. Okay. You also need to make sure that the, the, the small equipment cannot be too expensive, right? But uh, mm. that we need right. to continue to explore to make sure how, how we do and support that best. Mm. Mm. But, um, but I'm, I'm, I'm agree with what you said. I mean, each time we can, I would say, increase the efficiency of the system. In, in, each time we can, I would say, reuse the energy which is available. Mm. We, we need to do it. Yeah. And as you mentioned, it's also part of the Danfoss, I would say, philosophy. Exactly. Great. Thank you. Are there other ways that uh, refrigerant choice will have put, you know, put particular requirements or demands on system design or which components you use? Yeah, you mean um, what what comes from the refrigerant itself? If if that's your question. Yes. Yes. Sorry. Yes. So, for example, you know, do you need sort of different kinds of of, of pipe work? How much mm. um, uh, difficulty is there getting the right components for fl for flammable refrigerants? That kind of thing. Mm -hmm. 
yes, there there are these these requirements coming in or these influences. Let's put it like that. Mm. Let's take pipe work. If you go for an A2L or or a hydrocarbon, um, you can continue to use copper pipes because the pressure level is as we've we've used it or, or as we have it nowadays. So normal components, that's one thing. And then um, hydrocarbons are single molecules. I mean, not one molecule in the whole system, but it's only <laughs> one type of molecule, right? And that means you don't have a mixture and that means you don't have a glide. So it's easier to select a heat exchanger. That, that makes it quite easy there if you don't have a glide. Yeah, that's right. No glide. We have the same when we come to CO2, right? No glide. And uh, there you can also go with copper pipes. Of course, you often see on the high pressure side that you need uh, one an alloy with a lot of uh, iron inside. Uh, but it, it is uh, you see high pressure CO2 systems today being full, full copper. Um, and there we also have a natural refrigerant. And the good thing is that you can go with smaller pipes. So some OEMs argue that the uh, the first cost is reduced in some areas and increased in other areas. But one of the places that it's decreased is the, the ability to go for uh, smaller pipes, for example. Mm. And, and the sure. so for, 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 for components such as with condensed units or compressors, hermetic compressors, it's true that if you go to the A2L, you need to change a little bit, uh, which is the way you are manufacturing the product and designing the product, because you will be... Um, to the volume because they always have a ratio between pressure and volume you need to change and requalify all components to to comply with the PED. I mean they have some I would say redesign they have some adaptation for sure but I would say it's also the same for as you mentioned and there's for CO2 piping and and also for A3 because A3 we need to pay attention we also change a category of some components due to the flammability. That that's correct. Yes. However, the refrigerant itself um, is is a price component as well, or a cost component as well. Yeah. And and how do they compare on that? That's got to go in 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 favour of the the natural molecules of, of one kind and another again, presumably. Yeah. Uh, for example, I know that uh, CO two. Right. You need you need. Um, you cannot just go and use the the cheap CO2, right? You need some kind of refrigerant, um, uh, refrigerant grade. Uh, but uh, you can also not use uh, your propane from the barbecue, right? It also needs to go and buy a a, pro, a refrigerant grade uh -huh. propane, right? So uh, that's uh, that's, uh, that's it, correct. It, it, yeah, that's that's correct. Yes, um, it's not possible to use the CO2 that goes into into a drink. Um, because you need to have refrigerant grade and for the for the propane as well. And th thanks for mentioning barbecue propane. Uh, just side comment: if you ever have used barbecue, I mean probably everybody does, but um, if you ever have used propane to barbecue, then you might have realized that this propane smells. And if you use refrigerant grade propane. There is no smell. The reason why the barbecue propane smells is that there are added chemicals that make it smell. They are not in the refrigerant grade propane. And that means if you use refrigerant grade propane, you don't smell it. There is no warning. So please pay attention. Have that have that in mind. Just sorry, side side comment uh, here, but I wanted to mention that. Good. Sure. Thierry, are there any particular um, design considerations to bear in mind when you're using A2L options? No, as I, said, as I mentioned, you know, when we when we when we pay attention to the PED, uh, I would say, um, constraint or engineering design. No, we can use the same plus or minus. I would say component we already have. That means they have no major roadblock. I would say to design a system to use components. I would say with A2L, for sure there are some adaptation. For sure there are sustaining engineering to develop. I would say component, but we don't we don't change the habit of, of, of the designer. We don't change the habit of the installer and contractors. It is what we have today. Or similar similar about what we have today. Okay. 
Uh, so, comment, what comment, comment, comment we can oh. say because I'm up to now we talk a lot about how we say uh, we talk and that the purpose of the discussion. You know, we talk about how we say medium term, long term solutions according to the and base of the wave gas. But I think it's also uh, something we need to pay attention. Uh, we are talking about new installation. We are not talking about how we say after sales. We are not talking about how we say uh, uh, maintenance. We are not talking about uh, retrofitting. And the dialogue, I think, and the message could a little bit different. If you ask the questions, can we use A2L for retrofitting? I say no way. Move away. Same Ali. for for hydrocarbons. Oh, don't do that. <laughs> yeah, and the same for CO2. You need to you need to take care. You can of course you need to make sure that you select the right components for the right refrigerant. One hundred percent agree. But so just men mentioning, uh, cool. sorry, uh, but men Please. mentioning the retrofit, there is of course a solution for retrofitting. You can go to lower GWPs for existing systems, but all these solutions are non-flammable. You should stick to non-flammable solutions there because these systems that are out there are not designed for flammables. And if if you now put a flammable into one of these systems that that's a bit of a challenge because maybe the fan is not made for that and maybe the whole design where the systems are located so you shouldn't you shouldn't use a flammable refrigerant for retrofitting go for a non-flammable refrigerant and there is a wide range of solutions refrigerants and products available components and one and one at the beginning you know we were mentioning that i was doing a lot during the last five years, the industry in Europe make a lot of effort, new solutions. This is what we can say. Globally speaking, um, Danfoss have made a tremendous effort to qualify, I would say, a retrofitic A1 refrigerant, having a GLP below, I would say, the, the, what we used in the past. Okay, That means today, we have a complete portfolio okay, using A1 refrigerants, which is completely similar in terms of application design criteria as the one we have with the 404A that can be used. And we can devise by two the level of GLP very easily. We should not mm. forget it. Mm. That means if you really want to optimize the system because you have a customer that they want to pay attention to, but I would say the next five to 10 years, and he already have invest three years back with a 404A system. Okay, fine, go talk with him, and the solution will be to use A1 refrigerants. And, they have, and then those have many components, many, many co uh, components qualified, I would say, to provide this solution. Thank you. So what I'm hearing overall, you know, in the, the medium term and the long term is that there's really no one clear winner. Each approach has its own pros and cons. Um, and there will be a mixture of uh, approaches used. Um, if I had to ask you, though, to kind of guess the future, what do you think refrigerants and commercial refrigeration and supermarkets will look like in, say, another five years time or something like that? Uh, York, can I come to you first? Yeah, sure. Um, well, I see that more and more hydrocarbons are coming in because they offer this very low GWP solution. They don't fall under the F-gas regulations because they are no F-gases. They will probably never be banned. How, how can you ban a natural molecule? You can handle them in a safe way. You can build medium or small to medium term, not term, medium capacity systems. And they need to be hermetic, yes, but self-contained small to medium sized systems. That's where I see the hydrocarbons coming in more and more. Mm -hmm. I see the future very bright for, for CO2 as a refrigerant. Uh, I cannot see it turning any way back. You know, we, we, uh, we supply components to what we calculate to be in the tens of thousands of uh, new CO2 systems a year in, in where we uh, push our components. And um, it's already widely applied, for sure, in uh, in supermarket installations. So between, let's say, 15, 20 kilowatt and up to a little more than half a megawatt. Uh, but uh, we see this spread out now. Uh, we hear talks and we see applications where we talk air conditioning. That's maybe a, an extreme, but it will come and it's already done. Uh, we see... Um, uh, smaller systems as well. We we see the condensing unit coming to the market, uh, and then on the larger sizes also up in industrial refrigeration. Definitely, uh, CO2 will be a player, 
Uh, let's not dive into a lot of CapEx discussion here and back and forth of direct impact and indirect. Um, and then finally, um, I cannot see why CO2 should not continue. There's so much development going on and there's so much OEMs and end users pulling for this refrigerant, but it will not be the single one. I think you are onto something in your end there, York, for sure. Absolutely. Uh, A12 also we will remain in the rest. A12 will remain in the rest because as you have captured, I think David, during the call, we, we talk about, uh, I would say, um, cooling capacity or size of the installation. That means for sure, I would say, with the new standard coming to enlarge, I would say, the capacity of the propane in the system, they will have more and more, I would say, uh, such kind of, of, of equipment. Huh? Who remind, I would say, in the, in the beginning of the 19, when I was in on the fridge, we have, I would say, 134. Today, 99. Dot five percent are with hydrocarbon. That means okay, it's a trend, no doubt at all. But I think I really consider linked to the capex, linked to the yearly efficiency performance, linked to the easiness to uh, to install. I would say uh, some 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 medium size commercial refrigeration system. It will is still there. I would say for for a long time to, still. I, I just want to come back about what you said, uh, Jorg and, and, and others before. Uh, each time we are talking, we are talking about, I would say, new stuff, meaning that training is also something uh, very important because you cannot consider right now that 100% of the contractors installer in Europe are well trained to use, I would say, A3 refrigerant, to, to use CO2 but also including A2L. Well. That means we are all over Europe in a way also to change the mindset, to change the education, to, 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 to drive the, uh, the people, to be sure, or to support the people, drive is not the correct word, but to support the people, to consider and to think that the architecture of the design, the installations they are doing right now would change. You mentioned about charge limit, but why not to put, I would say, A2L well with a small charge limit, with a CO2, uh, uh, rack in the supermarket. It's a, an option. That means, for me, it's really, I would say, capex is something we need to have in mind. Uh, yearly uh, consumption is something we have to, to have in mind, meaning, I would say, direct emission is one thing, but indirect emission is also something very important. And in parallel of the F gas, guys, we cannot forget that we have the eco design system with some, I would say, new standard comings. That means it's, it will be more and more and more important also in the decision criteria of the refrigerants. I, I forget to mention that, David, before when you are asking questions, but I think it's also something we need to have in mind. 100 degree. We need to follow these and we need to make efficient equipment. But you, but you know me, Terry. I'm a natural refrigerant guy and you will never turn me over. Yeah. I'm sorry. <laughs> you will never turn me over. Naturals all the way. I'm, I'm, not uh, saying, I, I'm, I'm not saying that I would say CO2 is not the bad solution. Not at all. What I'm saying, I mean, we, we should avoid to say that I would say they will have only one solution, which is the natural. This is what I said. I want yeah, to but, share with agree. you. And you know also what I'm thinking. I agree. We will, we will not see a single solution. We will see many different solutions on the refrigerant side. And as you mentioned, Thierry, system designs. It, it is system not design, one yeah. fits all. We, that's over. If it ever was there, that's far from uh, that. That's over. Yeah. But the good we thing, guys, many the good, the good thing, guys, right? The good thing is that there is a solution for whatever temperature you want to serve. Yes. There is yes. a solution, Correct. and we are on a we are on a journey to make that a better and more sustainable solution for all of these end users out there. Then that it's difficult to navigate in. Let's hope that someone gets something out of of watching us now. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. I, but I think we can go on all day. That, that the big I think we're probably. The big difference... Sorry, carry on, carry on. No, uh, what Anders was saying is true. This is a big difference between, I would say, what was the perception of the market five years back when the FGAS have been implemented. Now we have a solution for each type of application. Now we can propose something. And, and really, I would say it will continue. It will continue because I would say all the industry, including Danfoss, will take the lead to develop more efficient products, more, I would say, sustainable uh, product for the futures, based on what we have said before. Mm. Right. I, as I say, I think we probably, we could talk about this uh, all night, but um, I, I think people will be keen to, to, to ask uh, ask questions of you, you guys in the chat room, and I'm keen to, to give uh, them some time for that. So 
there you have it. Thank you, experts, for your time. Thank you for watching. Uh, remember, if you do have questions, uh, you can come to the, the chat room uh, in, in a moment after this uh, broadcast. Of course, this debate is part of Cooling United Live. If you check tomorrow's program, you will find lots of relevant sessions uh, to go into more detail about this stuff. There's uh, cold room condensing units for ultra low GWP. There's A2L charge limits and flammability classifications, uh, CO2 installation service and how to use it in uh, food retail. Alternatively, if you'd like to find out more uh, about any of these approaches uh, in your own time or indeed any other refrigerant type, there's a ton of information uh, online at refrigerants.danfoss.com or, or you can find um, all of the um, the approved products uh, on store.danfoss.com. If you'd like some help choosing, you'll also find digital tools online uh, like Danfoss Cool Selector 2, uh, which is there to help you choose the right refrigerant and the matching components uh, that go with it. You can find that on uh, coolselector.danfoss.com. Um, but in the meantime, I will let you uh, move on to the chat. Thank you again uh, for joining us uh, and enjoy the rest of Cooling United Live. Goodbye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thanks, David. Thank you.